Hey everybody, welcome to the DBS Films Podcast. My name is Kellen, with me as always is my brother Brennan. Together we make movies with DBS Films. Today's episode, we're going to be highlighting and talking about some breaking news, which is the Screen Actors Guild has officially gone on strike, joining the Writers Guild. And we're basically going to highlight how this kind of happened in this episode. And then in the next episode this week, we're going to basically talk about what we think are some of the outcomes and how it affects a lot of different filmmakers out there. Be sure to go ahead and take a look at our Discord channel online because we make movies for our fans, with our fans, so that is the place to be if you ever want to find yourself behind set, on screen, any of those fun things. Also, be sure to take a look at our movies online. Horror in the Forest could be out by the time you're listening to this. A rent and review will mean the world to us. So this was something where, you know, we talked about the Writers Guild strike a few months ago and one thing we highlighted that would be a really big catalyst for a bigger development was if the screen actors guild sag joined them in which they have officially struck two days ago um their contract ran out and they have officially called a strike which means there is no longer any use of actors on set right now so that is actually a very big development before we hop into kind of some of the details there um, I really want to set up the environment of, you know, what's really kind of causing these negotiations in the first place. And really the big thing kind of comes into two different camps, I would say. Number one is pay. Um, one of the biggest things is residuals. Over the course of the years, we have talked about this once you move from DVDs, once you lose more of the theatrical ticket, it has become cheaper and cheaper to get a larger library. You know, think about it back in G even the early 2000s. How much money would you have to spend to even have a catalog to come close to Netflix for that cheap monthly uh, amount that you do have now? So really the revenue side of things is a big one. But then the second one, which has been developing a lot more rapidly, and honestly, the responses from the studios has been a little bit shocking on both of these, is the rise of AI and how AI impacts um, the writers and actors. So, Brian, do you want to kind of talk about these two pillars and, um, you know, why I think these are kind of the bigger issues that are overlaying these, these strikes? Yeah, I think um, the strikes right now, it's just going to be tough. Um, there's just a lot of change in the industry in the last 10 years. Um, and it's just, it's time for a new deal for the actors. It's time for a new deal for the writers. And unfortunately you're asking for money at a time where, you know, corporate profits are down. Netflix subscribers are down. I think people are looking to cut back a little bit on all these streaming services. So it's going to be a tough, it's tough for both, uh, you know, the writers and the actors. I think as far as the actors go, the two main things is AI, uh, making sure they're protected against AI. Um, I know I saw some stuff in there about digitally scanning extras and putting them in scenes um, and giving them a one-time compensation at $200, which is going to just almost overnight destroy the extra market, which is not very good because a lot of movie stars, up and coming stars, younger people um, get a lot of money from extras, um, extra work. So that's going to be tough, but it's just the residuals is a big thing. Um, that was a huge shift from streaming. Netflix really kind of introduced it. Um, you're just not getting the residuals that you used to get on DVD sales on, you know, every time a show would show up on cable, you would get a cut and that's just no longer the case. And it seems like it's even worse now because these large streaming services are not providing any data to anybody. And that's a huge, huge problem because you can't give people residuals if they don't have the data. And I think really, if I read the article correctly, what really broke down the talks is that the um, SAG really wanted to come in with their own analytics company or hire a third party analytics company to basically say, you know, to get an idea of the information and the data coming from these streaming platforms. And the streaming platform said it's not going to be accurate and just kind of threw it under the rug. And that's going to be a problem. And it's a problem for us too, because I get a quarterly check from all these streaming platforms, but there's no way for us to audit them. I have no idea how many views we're really getting. I have no idea how many downloads we're getting. You just kind of trust them. And there probably could be a class action lawsuit if enough people get together and go after the companies. 
But I mean, I just don't think that's going to happen. But there is almost no transparency outside of in the internal metrics that these companies use. And it's causing issues for actors, it's causing issues for distribution companies, it's causing issues for filmmakers. Um, whether or not we get that data, I don't know, because a lot of people say, hey, you know, our stuff runs on an algorithm and giving you that information is proprietary and, you know, we're just not going to do it. So. I don't see a solution to this stuff. Um, obviously, I am not a negotiator, but um, as of it's as of right now, man, both these um, you know both these strikes are are pretty brutal, and I don't see you know a compromise from either side's standpoint right now. I think both sides have their own you know they're digging their heels in here. And I think it's just going to be a tough time. And unfortunately, you know, for filmmakers and for films, uh, we're just going to have to weather this storm. Yeah, I mean, I think that really is the case. And first off, we do want to go ahead and 100% show our sympathy for both the screenwriters and the actors out there as creatives ourselves. I'm not saying I'm the best actor ever, but you can see me in The Haunting of the Murder House given an amazing performance. But really, we are on the side of the creatives here. Um, you know, DBS Films, we really take the entire creative process underneath our belts there. We're also not associated with any of those AMPTP uh, studios. So it really is something where, you know, we're operating in a different landscape from the Hollywood system, but I fully support them. I mean, you can just take a look. There has never been more revenue generated from content than any point in the entire history of mankind. And yet, as you mentioned, those revenues are being squeezed. I want to highlight why they're being squeezed, because I think this is also something there are a few shifting dynamics. And the first shift I want to talk about is they are making less money off the individual content. And it's more of a wide range of content that they make the money off of. It's the catalog. Whereas originally, you know, if you look early on back in like the 90s, you have DVDs. And if you get a deal, your DVD is automatically bought. You get automatic revenue from the DVD. That DVD then goes to blockbusters. If you look at things like television shows that have you know ads and commercials, there's a whole networking system. And because the shift from the market has gone from you know dvd physical in-person movies which are all higher revenue generations where you can allow a bigger cut of that revenue stream and pie per content to now streaming which is hey just the more bang the buck you can kind of get up there that has diluted the cost of it but the second thing to come into play is how dramatically fast these streaming companies aka our friendly tech companies have been able to grow and develop and i think the big issue now is you no longer have a, a studio system that's dominated by people that just make movies. You have a studio system that's dominated by Netflix, Amazon, Apple, and these companies have wildly different expectations and just goals when it comes to just the original studio system that we've had a while ago. And I think over the past 10 years, from 2010 to, you know, from 2015 to, to now, it's just been that almost kind of that rocket point where it's taken off and now streaming is the new media. You add that with the fact that they basically just, you know, had a Band-Aid deal during COVID because no one wanted to shut down work. We find ourselves in a very, very critical point here. So you kind of want to talk about how that shifting landscape occurred with these tech companies and also how the revenue per content has been decreased as well because of it. Yeah, I mean, it's just... It's difficult. I think a lot of the competition got taken away as far as like the bidding wars when the streaming services started to create their own content and they pre pretty much spent all the money on their own content and then any kind of outside stuff, they're give it a take it or leave it offer. And back in, you know, 2014 to 2016, when you had Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon Prime really kind of just looking to acquire content. This is back when The Office and all these bigger movies were moving off of the streaming platforms. And, you know, Netflix needed content, Hulu needed content, Amazon Prime needed content. They were giving indie films $250,000, $500,000 deals all the time until basically what happened was is they figured out how to make their own internal stuff. They got their own content mill going. And now, you know, there's some Netflix deals that are barely $10,000. Then they pretty much say, hey, we're going to give this to you and it's exposure. So there's a lot of horror stories as far as, you know, bad deals being signed just for exposure from filmmakers. 
and there really is no competition. And now you have the rise of Tubi, which is good. And I'm really hoping that the AVOD market picks up because all we need is a competitor to Tubi. And all of a sudden you start to get these bidding wars coming again with licensing deals. And once again, Tubi exclusives, Tubi originals, or Netflix exclusive, Netflix originals. Um, and I think that stuff might start to come back uh, as far as there might be a shortage of content due to all these strikes. And hopefully, you know, the indie market can kind of get picked up through this stuff. But I really think the biggest issue right now is the business model of these streaming services is just subscriber acquisition. They don't care if their movies are making money. They can lose money on their movies as long as they can acquire new customers, as long as they show, show their stockholders, hey, look, you know, we had 10% growth here. Subscribers are up another 100, 200,000. Um, yeah, we lost, you know, $200 million out of this one picture, but it's going to be worth it in the 10 year run. So now if you're a writer, if you're an actor and you're looking for residuals, how are they going to pay you residuals if the movie lost $200 million due to how, due to Hollywood accounting? It's not going to happen. So there's going to have to be some kind of shift or coming together um, as far as these business models you know, are concerned. They're going to have to be paid in residuals off of actual revenue, off of you know eyeballs, off of how many people saw this content, actual the actual total amount of views. The problem, once again, though, is that nobody's giving that data. So we're coming right back full circle to that, you know, they're not going to give you that data and there's no way to get residuals if you're not seeing that data. So that's where we're at. And, you know, there's it's just two different business models. You know, the actors and the writers from 20, 30 years ago, how it's always been done to the streamers, which is pretty much brand new in the last 10 to 15 years. Definitely the case. And I think the next thing, you know, as I kind of mentioned, the big one is the rise of AI, which I think honestly has been the most surprising coming from the studios, because I really think they're showing their cards of basically saying we are going to embrace AI as much as possible to absolutely crush these costs for making these, these productions. As a business, I can understand that element to it in the sense of that can dramatically reduce a lot of their costs, especially when for a one time $200 fee, you now have unlimited background actors, which is an incredible proposition for a studio. But that is, as you mentioned, something that will absolutely cripple the industry as we know it from the actor's perspective and side point. And I think really at first I thought this was almost kind of like a bluff card for them in the sense of, you know, like when the writers guild was or when the um when they went to the screenwriters guild and they were like, oh, well, we'll have like a seminar. And, you know, you know, we'll do these things. I thought it was something that they would quickly concede to and say, OK, you know, no AI for two years, no AI for anything. But I think this is where you can see the influence of people such as Apple and Netflix and tech companies that are probably foaming at the bits to get more AI and more automation to streamline their costs to do all of these things. But I think this is actually going to potentially be the biggest wall for them to overcome is they do not want to limit themselves to these agreements when it comes to the development of AI, because I think what they're afraid of is someone who doesn't have to follow these agreement rules to some degree or some rival or something like that, utilizing them would be under able to undercut them. So it's really, really interesting how the rise of AI is, I think, now the biggest question mark for this one. And I mean... The thing with the AI is, you know, it feels like every single month there's something new. I mean, you have Adobe is working dramatically. We always mention that editing is going to get really, really kind of cut down. Screenwriting, while, well, you know, again, it's not there, it will generate a lot of work for a writer. So whether you can't have that right, right now, you probably can't have that final product ready to go. What you can do is almost condense, you know, 10 writers into one writer with the power of AI or 10 actors into one actor if you have the ability to you know use their likeness or even shift or modify their likeness and i think you're seeing there the way they're looking at it is they no longer have to pay as many people for the same product right away and that's only going to continue to increase so what are kind of your thoughts on just the ai wild card as it is right now yeah ai i mean this is where you're gonna have to dig your heels in um, because there's going to be a lot of AI stuff coming forward. The technology is going to get better um, with each year that we go by. And I think the people who are trying to bury their heads under the dirt and say no AI at all, 
Um, unfortunately, you just can't ban that stuff. It's just not going to happen. I think you have to embrace it. You have to use it as a tool, but you also have to make sure that you're protected. And a big one is because um, we have a DBS branch of Audible, which is voiceover stuff. And the voiceover AI stuff has gotten very, very good. Not only can you have pretty much speaking AI voices right now that are very difficult to discern from human voices, but you also have the ability to steal people's voices and put them on an audio track. Now, obviously, we don't do that here at DBS, um, and Audible does not allow that currently at this time, but the technology is there. And it has to be something that, you know, you're aware of. And, you know, the actors, there's nothing with the deep fakes and stuff and the technology where it's at right now. You can easily have inserts for actors. Um, I think it's been done before um, with some other actors where it's very hard to tell that they're CGI, the computer generated. Um, it's going to be a big thing for audio stuff. I know there's a, a hack in the Hollywood system where... If the person doesn't speak, then they don't get a full day rate or they get the lower day rate. Um, and there were some uh, producers that were actually using someone else's voice. So they'd only pay for the voiceover and just use it for that character, which is kind of an interesting technique. Um, but it's like stuff you got to be careful with that stuff. That's 100 percent what they're fighting for right now is, you know, your image and likeness as an actor is pretty much how you draw revenue is how you get people to go to your box office. They want to see you. They want to hear you. And if that stuff is being artificially generated, it's a huge concern. And I definitely think that the actors need to be aware of this. And, you know, once the cat's out of the bag or they don't get themselves in a good negotiating um, position, these studios are really going to go with this one because it's cheaper. You don't need a huge production, can cut costs, and you can use an actor over and over and over and over again um, without maybe compensating them as much as they deserve. That's a really scary. That's it's pretty much a Black Mirror episode. So, you know, I'm hoping that they, like the writers, you know, the actors stand strong and really get – make sure the deal that they're putting in place is being put in place for the next 10 to 15 years, because this technology is only going to accelerate. It's only going to get better. hundred percent. So I was going to go ahead and wrap up this episode of the potential black mirror that will become the Hollywood system. Um, as always, be sure to take a look at us online, join our discord channel, get all the behind the scenes to get the opportunity to be on set with us. Cause we make movies for our fans with our fans. Also take a look horror in the forest could be out right now. If you went rent and review, it, it means the world to us. The next episode, we're going to basically hop and do what we think is going to kind of be a potential conclusions for all of this. But again, we just want to go ahead and give our solidarity to all of the actors, all of the creatives, all of the writers out there, because this is something that needs to happen. You know, it really is the case where they need to stand up for these rights come together collectively and we wish them all the best in this creative process. But until then, have a good one.